Welcome to the Aspen Center for Physics Public Lecture Series. The Aspen Center for Physics was founded in 1961 by local physicist George Stranahan with Michael Cohen and Bob Craig. The center provides a serene environment in which almost 1,000 prestigious physicists from around the world, young postdocs just out of graduate school to Nobel laureates, come together during winter and summer sessions to share, discuss, and initiate new research. It took only two days at the center before I realized that this was what I had always dreamed doing science would be like. The beauty and peacefulness of the center is a really important asset to us. It is our opportunity to be cut off just enough from the daily grind to have lively discussions at the blackboards, share meals out on the lawn, gaze at the surrounding hills, and actually think about physics. Thinking initiated at the Aspen Center for Physics, from biophysics to neutrinos to the outer reaches of the universe has provided the underlying logic for the MRI, the CAT scan, and laptop computers, and will in the future provide the logic for innovations that will transform human endeavors. Professor Sigurdsson. I'm uh, the co-organizer of one of the current workshops uh, on black holes, which is running for the next three weeks. And um, we would like to thank the uh, Institute and the Center for the Hospitality and uh, uh, note that it's uh, coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Aspen Center for Physics. It's been a uh, really astounding success from our perspective with uh, providing an incredibly productive and good working environment for really the uh, without any modesty, uh, many of the top scientists uh, in the US and the world over the decades. And it is very much appreciated. Now, our uh, speaker tonight, kicking off the summer series, is uh, Dr. Daniel Holtz. Uh, Daniel was an uh, undergraduate at Princeton, uh, where he studied under uh, the extremely uh, well-known physicist John Wheeler, uh, who has, among others, coined the phrase black hole, and uh, also uh, for those of you who like to keep up with uh, uh, trends in uh, modern physics, he also coined the it from bit uh, concept, uh, if you like that. Um, Daniel then went on to uh, do his PhD in physics with uh, Bob Wald at the University of Chicago, and then had research positions at the Einstein Institute in Berlin, actually just outside Berlin, uh, the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics at the uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, uh, the other Kavli Institute in Chicago, and then uh, a few years ago, he took the Richard Feynman Fellowship, uh, which is one of the most prestigious and nicest fellowships in uh, theoretical physics, at the Theory Division of Los Alamos, where he has been since. Although, uh, rumor has it that he will be going back to Chicago to take up a professorship uh, at the end of the summer or around about then. And Daniel's going to talk to us. Uh, Daniel works on a range of interesting topics. Uh, he works at the interface between general relativity, astrophysics, and cosmology, and in particular has worked on uh, gravitational lensing, one of Einstein's famous predictions for uh, the difference between general relativity and uh, classical gravity, uh, and on gravitational waves, which is one of the main focuses of the current workshop. Uh, and Daniel uh, was one of the people who uh, introduced the concept of standard sirens in gravitational waves, whereby you could, if you could measure a signal, you would be able to calibrate the universe using gravitational radiation. Uh, I actually first met Daniel a few years ago here at Aspen, where uh, despite his theoretical proclivities, he uh, demonstrated uh, very good um, experimental aptitude. Uh, at that particular time, he was on a board uh, bombing down uh, one of the mountains. Uh, and uh, I'm told that he also likes wheels in the summer and equally steep gradients. And for some reason, he seems to be here a lot. Uh, Daniel? Can you hear me? My, yes, one, two, three. Okay. So it's really great to be here. Um, um, as Stein mentioned, uh, I really like Aspen. And uh, so what I'll be uh, talking to you about is uh, gravitational waves. But I'm going to start with a little bit. Um, on the center. Um, as you probably all know, the Aspen Center for Physics is just across the meadow. And uh, 
I first came here as an undergraduate, which um, hopefully they're sorry if I don't <laughs> like I'm not undergraduates aren't supposed to come to the center, but I met some a senior person took me in and I sort of snuck into one of the programs, and it was my in some sense my introduction to physics. Um, because the center is, there are all these brilliant people there, and they're just there to do physics, to do science. They, they, you wander around, you have these deep discussions, you're at the blackboard, you go for hikes, and you're discussing, and you, know, you sit with your lemonade at the Paradise Bakery, and you're discussing physics, and it's just, it's, it's a fantastic environment. And as an undergraduate, it was a revelation that, that there existed places like this and communities like this that you could be a part of. And I've been uh, very fortunate to come back uh, a number of times officially. And, um, and it's really been in incredibly productive for me um, and, and really an important part of, of my life so far. And you know, I also I do enjoy the snowboarding and the mountain biking and just being here. But, uh, but it, it's a very special place. And so the, the Aspen, the Aspen community has played a large role in making the Aspen Center for Physics what it is. And so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, and I'd also like to thank you for just sharing this, this magnificent place with a bunch of physicists. And I think it's, it's really special. So, um, so, what, uh, oh, so just to sort of cap what's going on now. So there are a couple of programs that have been going on in the last couple of weeks and will be going on for the next few weeks, um, all centered on black holes. Uh, the program for the last couple of weeks was on big black holes, the black holes at the center of galaxies, and then now we're moving on to intermediate and smaller mass black holes. Um, and it's been you know, a great program so far. And unfortunately, I'm leaving at the end of this week. But, uh, but it's really been fantastic. Um, OK. And, and I, in this, um, one of the things, there's sort of a theme, and it's a growing theme, is black holes. But one of the interesting things about black holes right now is, is using them as sources of gravitational waves. And so what this talk is going to focus on is the gravitational wave aspect of, of this topic of, of black holes and other sources of gravitational waves. So um, I'm going to sort of start with the punchline. Okay? And this is the basic idea of this talk, which is that there's a comparison between seeing the universe and listening to the universe. And gravitational waves allow you to listen to the universe. And that's radically new and different. So essentially, everything we know about the universe, we've learned from observations, from telescopes that peer you know, into the heavens, and we figured all sorts of things out about our universe by doing that. And these are optical telescopes, or radio, or x-ray, or gamma ray, a whole range microwave. We've covered the spectrum, and we've learned a tremendous amount. But over the next decade, we're going to sort of probe the universe in a radically different way, and that's through gravitational waves. And this is a picture of a gravitational wave observatory, and I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that. But, but it's, it's, it's truly new and different, and that's what makes it you know, exciting. I mean, this is a very different era we're going into. And that's part of why everyone is talking about this, and you're going to hear a lot more about this in the coming years. So, um, and I'll just point out that 90%, 95% of the universe is dark, and that dark matter and dark energy. And the, the, the way we detect that stuff, this 95% of the universe, is through its gravitational effect. That's essentially the only interaction it has. So, so although we can observe all sorts of things, you can't directly observe dark matter and dark energy. So observing gravity directly is a very interesting thing to do, and it's one of the things that gravitational waves do. It's a direct probe of gravity. So, so there's a revolution at hand, and I'm going to give you some of the background behind that revolution. So here's, here's that outline of the talk. I'm going to start with a brief history of gravitational waves. And then I'm going to talk about what they are and give you some sense of how they all work. Um, then I'll discuss how we find them, what it means to sort of detect gravitational waves, and why you should care. So that's the plan. So I'm going to start with the history. And this is, my ver this is the physicist version of the history. So Great, you know, greatly simplified, but, but it's a very interesting story. So we'll start turn of the century. Einstein and you know, a bunch of other people revolutionized physics. At the end of the day, physics was broken down into 
two theories, quantum mechanics and general relativity, and these two theories essentially account for everything we observe. So every phenomenon that we've seen can, physical phenomenon, can, falls into one of these two categories. Now, there's a minor problem that th these two theories don't actually play well together. They're, they're sort of fundamentally inconsistent, but that's actually, a, in some sense, a theoretical issue. In practice, everything falls down into the, it falls into one of these two theories, and we can account for everything. So that's the overall view. Now the talk, what I'm gonna focus on is general relativity. Um, so, so this is, this gravitational waves are, so one of the things in general relativity, and I'm just gonna spend just a minute trying to give you an overview of, sort of a feeling for what general relativity is about. So general relativity is the theory of gravity. It's a beautiful theory, incredibly compelling. Uh, Einstein wrote down the equations in 1915. Um, and it's one of those things where when you look at it, you just feel like it must be right. It just fits together perfectly. You can't mess with it, everything. It's just, it's just this beautiful way of looking at the universe. Um, and one of the key aspects of general relativity, and you've probably heard this, is that spa space and time are intertwined into one thing called space-time. And everything happens within space-time. And John Wheeler likes to say, space or like to say, space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. So th what that means is that if you look at the Earth, the Earth goes around the sun. But the Earth doesn't really know it's going around the sun. What the Earth thinks it's doing is just going in a straight line. But the space is curved, and, that, and because it's curved, the Earth ends up actually going around in a circle. And that's what it means for the Earth to orbit the sun. And the reason the space is curved is because the sun is there, and it creates curvature. So that's the matter telling space-time how to curve. And, and that view can explain all of gravity. So that's, that's the basic theory, and there, a bunch of things come out of it. Um, and so these are some of the key predictions that came out of general relativity. Um, one was the perihelion precession of Mercury, which is just Mercury is in orbit around the sun, and if you study the orbit very carefully, it doesn't quite do what you expected it to do. There's a slight shift in the orbit. Um, and this was known, and it turns out that Einstein's theory explained that shift. And that was a major success of the theory. And one of the other things that general relativity predicts is that the universe is dynamic, that the universe won't sit still. And at the time that that came out, that was incredibly radical. It was, we don't appreciate now what a radical notion it is that the universe hasn't been around forever. And it was so radical that in some sense, Einstein, he didn't feel like he could have a theory that did that and he fiddled with it to make it so that it allowed for a fixed universe. And that's called the cosmological constant and that's a whole different talk. It's a very, very interesting subject. Um, and that's related to the dark energy and a lot of the excitement in cosmology right now. Another prediction was the bending of light. And this was tested in 1919 through a solar eclipse and was shown to work. And in some sense, that was the first test of a clear prediction of Einstein's new theory. And that caused a big fuss and kind of made him a star. Um, another prediction is black holes. And then a final prediction is gravitational waves. Um, and, and in some sense, gravitational waves is one of the last predictions of Einstein that hasn't been directly observed yet. And so what I'll be talking about is, you know, how do we observe them? So, so here is going to be my brief synopsis of the history. And the history of gravitational waves, it, it was messy. And it explains part of the reason that within physics there's a sort of a delicacy around this topic. Okay. And so it starts out happily enough. Einstein predicts gravitational waves. He wrote a paper in 1916 and says, I have this new theory, and by the way, it has gravitational waves in it. Um, then um, that kind of, you know, the, the situation changes. Um, in 1922, I mean, people started to wonder whether gravitational waves really existed. And, and this has something to do with gravity. Mean, it's the theory of general relativity. And the relativity part, you know, this idea that everything is relative, it, what it comes down to is every, lots of things are observer dependent. So my time, what I say, you know, it's five o'clock, someone else, somewhere else could say, no, actually it's six, and we're both right. It's all relative. You're, it's all consistent. But, but the point is that everything is observer dependent. So these gravitational waves, 
you could write down the equations for gravitational waves. I mean, it's in your theory, there they are. But then you could imagine a different observer who might say, actually, there are no gravitational waves there. And this caused raging debates about whether gravitational waves were real or not, whether they can't carried any energy. And one of the most damning quotes is this one. Gravitational waves travel at the speed of thought. They don't travel at the speed of light. They don't travel at any physical speed. They're just made up. Um, and, and there was this, there were a few decades where people, there were these raging debates. Einstein at some point actually wrote a paper saying, oh, you know what, they don't exist. My bad, sorry about that. And he submitted it to be published in the Physical Review. And it was refereed, and the referee said, actually, I think you've made some mistakes and your arguments don't quite hold together and uh, I think your conclusion is a bit too strong. And Einstein got this referee report back and said, you know, I, I submitted this paper to be published. I did not submit this paper to be refereed. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to go to a different journal. And he did, and eventually it was published. But by the time he published it, he had actually fixed some of the errors, and his conclusion was that, you know, maybe gravitational waves are okay. Um, so it's really been a very, you know, interesting history. Um, there were a lot, you know, the arguments sort of persisted. Very prominent people went back and forth. There were different camps. It, it's one of these things where you have a theory, but you're just not entirely sure what the theory is telling you. Um, sometime around, I would say, the 80s, there developed a theoretical consensus. Yes, actually, he was right all along, and gravitational waves do exist. So that's the theory side. So that's my theory history. Now I'll move on to the experimental history. So Einstein predicted gravitational waves in 1916. Um, now, one of, the one of the aspects of gravitational waves is that they're very weak, and I'll talk more about that a little later. So because they're weak, um, it's, uh, no one really expected to see them, certainly not anytime soon, which is why there were all these theorists arguing, because there was no data to kind of clarify the situation. So Joe Weber, in 1960, convinced himself that the gravitational waves are real and decided, okay, I'm going to build a detector and try to find them. And Joe Weber... He was a brilliant experimentalist. He, he invented the laser at the same time as Charlie Towns and company did. They won a Nobel Prize for it, but, but he's really, he's absolute, you know, top caliber experimentalist. He invented a way to detect gravitational waves using a bar detector. I'll talk about that a little more. And then, in 69, he published this paper saying, you know what, I've seen them. I've seen gravitational waves. And this you know, rocked the physics world. Because at this time, theorists were still arguing about whether gravitational waves even existed. And here he came along and said, I've seen them. And not only that, but if he had seen them, the sort of naive predictions were he, he couldn't possibly have seen them given how sensitive his instrument is. There must be a lot more gravitational waves than we ever expected. And in fact, way too many, and it's a big problem. And, and so it was one of these things where it just, it was amazing that they had been seen, but it also made no sense, and, and it sort of, it, it caused a big stir um, at the time. Um, so for, you know, decades after that, everyone tried to find these waves, and no one else could find it. They built independent, you know, instruments, their own bar detectors. No one could find the waves that Weber was finding, and he continued to find them. And for decades, he continued to find them. And he said, here they are. He showed all his data. Um, people criticized his data analysis techniques. There were strong arguments that he, he really wasn't seeing them. But till the end, he claimed he was seeing gravitational waves, but no one else ever saw them. Um, so, so that was a sort of unfortunate episode. Um, then uh, in, uh, I think it was 74, Hulse and Taylor, these two guys, um, discovered a binary pulsar. And a, a pulsar for the purposes of this talk, a pulsar is just a clock. It just ticks. And it's very, very regular. So I think this one ticks 17 times a second, and it's, it's absolutely stable. But this is a binary pulsar that they discovered, which means it's in orbit around another star. So, so you have this, this clock that's in orbit. And by looking at the ticks, you can, you can see what the orbital period is. Now, gravitational waves, if they're real, should carry off energy, which means that eventually this, the orbit should get tighter and tighter. There should be an in spiral. 
So if, there's really, if there are really gravitational waves, you should be able to see this thing slowly spin in. Okay? So they observed it for a long time, did very, very careful measurements. And I, I, probably, I, I only have two plots. This is one of them. The details are completely irrelevant. I mean, this is time, and if you like, this is a measure. Of the, it's the period. And the only point of this plot is they made these measurements over many years. And these red dots that you see here are the data points. And this blue line is what the theory, what general relativity predicts for what the emission of gravitational waves should do to the system. And you, know, you don't have to be a physicist to know that curve goes right through the data points. This is a, an amazing verification of what we predict gravitational waves should do. So this was a big deal. I mean, this meant our theory seems to work, and gravitational waves genuinely carry off energy. Um, and uh, they won the Nobel Prize. This is the two of them celebrating. Um, it, it's a big deal. Now, the one thing about this, just in the context of this talk, is that this is an indirect measurement of gravitational waves. You're not actually seeing the waves. You're observing some system, and it's spinning down, and you say, oh, look, it's losing energy. There must be gravitational waves. But physicists like to actually directly observe things. Inference makes you just a little nervous. So we would still really like to directly observe gravitational waves. And that's going to be the topic of the rest of the talk. How do you actually directly see them? This indirect evidence from the pulsar, binary pulsar, we're reasonably confident these waves exist, but would like to actually see them directly. Um, and so that's the goal. And, and sort of where we are now, what makes this exciting now is that for the last couple of decades, this gravitational wave observatory has been built. Um, it's called LIGO, and I'll, I'll talk more about it. And so we believe now, for the first time, we're actually on the verge of detecting these gravitational waves. So after all this stuff that's gone on on the theory and experimental side, we're finally going to really see them. And, and that should be fantastic. So that's, that's my version of the history. Um, so now, uh, what I was going to do is tell you a little bit about gravitational waves themselves. What are they? What do they do? Um, but maybe I'll stop if there are any questions at this point. Yeah. So the question was, uh, were there any competing theories to explain the binary pulsar? And I don't know of any, in part because the measurements are so good that whatever the theory is would have to produce the same equation in some sense. So I think at that point, you feel pretty good about it. Now, it doesn't mean that the gravitational waves get to us. The gravitational waves could disperse some other way. All we know is that that system is losing energy. Yep. So are there any other questions? OK. OK. So now I'll spend a little time on gravitational waves themselves. So I'm, going, so I'm going to give you two sort of heuristic, hand-wavy arguments for why there are gravitational waves. Um, and needless to say, given that a lot of smart people, including Einstein, argued about this for decades, I'm not going to show you that gravitational waves ex exist from a theory perspective. I'm just going to motivate why you should not be surprised that there is something like a gravitational wave. Okay. So I'll start with electromagnetism. Okay, and electromagnetism has photons. Now, this is not scary. This is something you actually, everyone knows about. This is just light. And the way you generate light, light, are, you know, excit light is excitations of this electric field. The way you generate that is by shaking an electron. If you shake an electron, it produces light. This light could be radio. It could be... Um, um, microwave and heat your food. It could be x-ray, make nice images of your body. All that is light, and all that is generated fundamentally by shaking electrons. Um, so, so this is something you're actually very familiar with in your day-to-day -day life. Um, now, general relativity has the same thing. So in electromagnetism, the, the key charge is charge. It's electron or proton, anything that's charged will do this when you shake it. In gravity, the analog is mass. Anything that has mass, anything that's heavy, 
if you shake it, does the same thing. It generates this, the equivalent of a photon. It generates something which propagates out and looks like light, only it's a gravitational wave. So the equations look essentially identical. So the point is, whatever the process is in electromagnetism that generates light, there should be an equivalent process in gravity where you shake a mass and it produces this gravitational wave. Okay. So that's a hand wavy argument, but it says, okay, you might not be surprised. So I'm gonna give you another argument which has to do with general relativity itself. Okay. So within general relativity, um, probably everyone's heard that there's this speed limit that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And when you say that, you really mean nothing. Information about an event cannot travel faster than the speed of light. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light. Okay. So now imagine the following scenario. Let's take you know, a very massive bowling ball and we'll put it in the corner of the room. So there's a bowling ball way over there. Now if I have a sensitive detector, I mean these things exist, they're gravity detectors, gravitometers. They're used to detect oil deposits underground. You can buy this on you know, Amazon. If you use one of these, I could see that there was a bowling ball in the corner of the room. If it, you know, if it has a lot of mass, I can detect that. I'm being pulled slightly to that bowling ball and I can measure that. So that's all fine. Now suppose someone sneaks in, takes that bowling ball and runs across to the other side of the room. Now, my detector is, you know, at the, when all is said and done, my detector is gonna say, no, no, the bowling ball is over there. The question is, how does it know that it's moved? Something has to go from that bowling ball to my detector and say, oh, by the way, the bowling ball is moving. It can't be instantaneous because that would be faster than the speed of light. So, you know, in, in some sense, the best case is something comes from at the speed of light from the bowling ball to my detector to say, the bowling ball is moving, so you better start moving your needle. And that's a gravitational wave. So gravitational wave just carries the information that the gravitational field is changing, that things are moving. Okay. Again, this is a heuristic argument, but it, it motivates why you might expect there to be something like gravitational waves, that the gravitational waves might and do, it turns out, travel at the speed of light. And it just carries information about what all the masses are doing. Okay. Okay. So now I'm gonna move on to what gravitational waves actually do. Um, and the basic effect of a gravitational wave is very, very simple. If you have, um, so if I just, between me and someone sitting in the back row, there's some distance between us. If a gravitational wave comes through this auditorium in this direction, what it'll do is it'll change that distance. It'll make it slightly longer and slightly shorter and it'll go back and forth, and that's all the gravitational wave does. This is sort of in the absence of all other forces. Okay. Now, if, if there's also someone over there, so I have two perpendicular directions, what happens is you see that they're in some sense perfectly out of phase. When that person is closer, that person is gonna be slightly farther away, and then it's gonna revert back and forth. And that's what these, this little video is supposed to show you. The way to think about this is this is a bunch of you know, little masses floating in space. And, and if there were no gravitational waves, they would just sit there as a circle and never change. And when a gravitational wave goes through, what it does is it causes the distances to all vary with time. Okay. And that's all a gravitational wave does, is it causes distances to shift back and forth, back and forth. Okay. Um, now you can ask, okay, so, so what creates these waves that do this? And um, as I've argued, it's basically anything that moves. When I do this, I create a bunch of gravitational waves. Um, shifting in your seat, you're creating gravitational waves. A anyone that moves, anything that happens, an airplane taking off, anything, they all create gravitational waves. But the key aspect of gravitational waves is that they're very, very weak. And this is why you know, they still haven't been detected 100 years later. Um, this is why there have been all these raging debates. They're very weak. And so to get what I would call a strong gravitational wave, you need a large mass. By large, I mean on the order of the mass of the sun. That would be good, or maybe a lot more. And you need to move very fast. And by very fast, I mean 
close to the speed of light. That's how you get strong gravitational waves. My arms, not that massive, and I just can't move them that fast. So all this, all this motion generates gravitational waves, but they're incredibly weak. And to get strong, strong waves, you need, you need massive things moving very, very fast. And now, fortunately, in the universe, there actually are massive things moving very, very fast. For example, black holes or neutron stars are very, very massive objects. If you like, can be very dense in some sense. And they orbit each other. And those orbits are very, very fast, especially as they get close to merging, as they get close to crashing into each other. So that's a natural system and sort of the prototypical system for gravitational wave sources. So if you have one of these binaries, they satisfy, these are called black hole binaries, they satisfy this condition of a lot of mass moving very fast. You can also imagine a star falling into a big black hole. Right at the end, it's moving very, very quickly, and a star has a fair amount of mass, so you get gravitational waves. Um, a supernova also, this is the sort of the end of life of big stars. They, they explode in a supernovae. Supernova, and, and that's a lot of material being ejected very, very fast. And again, you can get gravitational waves. But the subtle point is that it has to be asymmetric. If it's perfectly symmetric, there are no gravitational waves. Uh, we can talk about that later. And the Big Bang itself might produce gravitational waves. We don't know. There's, a, in some sense, a lot of energy there and a lot of stuff happening. Various theories predict detectable gravitational waves. We're, we're not sure about that. It's one of the things we'd really like to observe. It would be fantastic to observe. Um, but let me just show you um, the sort of classic example of, of a gravitational wave source. So this is a movie of binary black holes. Um, so, so each of those spheres is a black hole. And all this stuff around it are the gravitational waves. Okay. And I'll, I'll just take an aside now to note that calculate. So this is all the gravitational wave emission. Calculating what that is is hard. There's a very simple expression which, which works in, very, you know, in a very simplified way. But if you really want to know what the gravitational waves are being emitted, you need to go to a supercomputer. So these are all supercomputer simulations. So I'll show you a few movies. They're all done on supercomputer, supercomputers. They're very hard to do because, for example, those are black holes. If you have a black hole, everything wants to fall into the black hole. and, and all the stuff you're using to compute falls into the black hole. It turns out to be a very, very difficult problem, which has only been solved in the last decade. So now we can do calculations of black holes merging and the gravitational waves that come off. Um, so, so this is the sort of thing you see, and this is a very strong source of, of gravitational waves. Okay. Now, I'm just going to spend a couple of slides and talk about this issue of listening versus seeing because you'll hear this a lot, which is that gravitational waves, you don't really look at the universe, you, you in some sense listen to the universe. So I'm going to try to give you some sense of why that is. Again, this is kind of hand-wavy, but it just gives you the flavor of the arguments. Um, so the first thing is if you build a gravitational wave detector, and I'll talk more about those shortly, they, they are omnidirectional. They, they, in some sense, observe the entire sky. So if this is my detector, it can see sources anywhere. And that's like your ears. You can hear sources anywhere. When you look, you can only look in one particular place. So in that sense, gravitational wave detectors are like ears. It's like listening more than it's like seeing. Okay. Another thing is that gravitational waves aren't scattered or absorbed. They interact very weakly with everything else. And so in this sense, one way to think about it is if, if you have a speaker at the, you know, on the other end of the auditorium, and it's, you know, playing Mahler, and you're listening to it, it's very hard to block that sound. You can't just put up a panel and have all the sound go away. The stuff gets to you. You have to work very hard to insulate sound. Well, if there were just a light, and you were just looking at a light bulb over there, it's actually pretty easy to cover it, and then you don't see the light bulb anymore. And so in that sense, it's very easy to block electromagnetic waves. I mean, if there were a source of x-rays, you might need a lead brick. But all you have to do is put it in the way and the stuff can't get through. But that's not true with gravitational waves. And that's great. It's one of the reasons we're particularly excited about gravitational waves, because nothing blocks them. So if you have gravitational waves 
generated, say, in the very early universe after the Big Bang, very shortly after the Big Bang, those gravitational waves travel across the universe and don't get changed at all. And you get to observe them and you get to get a picture of the universe the way it was right after the Big Bang. That's fantastic. And in the same way, if you have black holes merging, it doesn't matter if they're in the middle of a galaxy far, far away. All of that's irrelevant. The gravitational waves come out from the very center of those black holes and they make it right to you undisturbed because the gravitational waves go through everything. That's fantastic. The downside of that is that the gravitational waves go through everything, including your detector. The, your detector doesn't stop gravitational waves. So it's very hard to see these. This is part of the reason you can't see them, is because they go through everything. So it's sort of a you know, good side and a bad side. This is the way it goes. So if we can observe them, if we manage to get some of that energy into our detector, it would be very, very interesting because we're learning, we're, we're, we're in some sense probing the very insides of what's happening. Totally undisturbed, pristine picture. Okay. And uh, another thing, uh, gravitational waves don't really image. In the same way, when you listen to something, you listen to someone talking, you don't get a clear sense of what they look like, all the fine detail. You, you get a sort of, you, 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 what you're really getting is information of sort of, in some sense, macroscopic information, bulk motion information. And it's the same thing with gravitational waves. You're not getting details of the surface of black holes. You're seeing overall what's happening in a bulk, in a bulk manner. And that's unlike photons, unlike light, where you really do get to see all the details. So again, these are all arguments that say gravitational waves, in some way, when you think about it, they're more like listening than they are like seeing. It's a radically different way to, to sort of get information about the universe. Okay. But just to be clear, okay, this is an analogy. Gravitational waves are not sound. And I want to be 100% clear on this. Sound are compression waves in air. You know, it's fine on Earth, but the second you get you know, away from the Earth, there is no sound. And in empty space, there's no sound. Those explosions in Star Wars don't exist. There's no sound. Gravitational waves are these ripples in the actual space-time fabric, if you like. And those exist. And those we can listen to, but we're not listening to them with our ears, we're listening to them with detectors. So I'm going to be somewhat liberal in my use of sound. I've given you these arguments for why it's kind of like sound, but it is not sound. Okay? So I just want to be clear on that. So having said that, one of the other things about gravitational waves is it just turns out that if you take gravitational waves from solar mass objects, objects roughly the mass of our sun, if you just take those waveforms and you put them into a speaker, you can hear them. The frequencies just happen to be in the audible range of the human ear. That's just happenstance. There's nothing fundamental there. But that's the way it goes. So that's part of the reason we talk about them as sound. And so I'm going to show you another movie. And what you're hearing are the gravitational waves. So that's what gravitational waves sound like. And that's sound. So that was a gamma ray burst, two neutron stars orbiting. Um, and again, the details aren't important, but that's, that's the, basic, the basic sound. And what you see is that as they orbit, they actually spin up as they lose energy because they get closer and closer together. And so the frequency goes up and up, and you get what's called a chirp. That, whoop, that part is the chirp, and that gives you a lot of information. And so I'm just going to play that again. And I should say the sound, Sam Finn, whom I think is in the audience, um, uh, made this for me yesterday. So that's, and that last bit is the two, the two objects merging. That, that sound is really for black holes. That wasn't black holes, so I'm taking a little liberty here. But what happens is when the two black holes finally merge, then they very rapidly rig down and there's nothing. And it goes completely quiet. And that sound, that gravitational wave, whoop, that's what we want to detect. And so that's the goal. Um, and I'm going to do one more aside here, which is, OK, I've been talking about strong gravitational waves. These black holes merging, they emit a lot of gravitational waves. But I need to get you oriented on what I mean by strong. So when you're in the gravitational wave field, strong takes on a whole different meaning 
it's not strong in, in the way that anything else that you talk about in physics is strong. So the sorts of numbers you talk about are 10 to the minus 21. So this dimensionless wave strain, which sounds a little scary, is just the fractional change in length that we're talking about. So you know, between me and someone at the back of the room, that length changes by one part in 10 to the 21. That's what we would call a very strong gravitational wave. Okay. And just to get oriented, one part in 10 to the 21 um, is the equivalent is if the person in the back of the room were miles away, the change in length between us is a fraction of the size of a proton. It's tiny. That's a strong wave, this tiny, tiny little effect. So at this point, you should be saying, this is all crazy. No, wonder, no one's ever going to observe anything like that. That's essentially impossible. And you know, to first approximation, you'd be right. Like We could just pack it in now, except it turns out we think we can observe them. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. OK, so that's my discussion of what gravitational waves are. And next, I was going to talk about finding gravitational waves. But maybe I'll just stop to see if there are any brief questions at this point. Yeah. So, so you can imagine cases where that happens. So again, the gravitational waves are very, very weak. So to have two gravitational waves see each other, that have to be incredibly strong. So one of the things, I mean, this was, you know, again, John Wheeler, I think, came up with this, was this idea that if you have enough gravitational waves running around in one place, one of the things about <coughs> general relativity, which you probably heard, is that E equals mc squared. Energy and mass are sort of part and parcel of the same thing. So if you have a lot of gravitational wave energy in one place, it looks like it's mass. And you can have enough mass there, effective mass, to actually keep it bound. So you can imagine making something that actually stays there and is just gravitational waves. And that would be gravitational waves sort of interacting. But I mean, that's, it's interesting, it's, but it's, it's not going to happen. I mean, we have, you know, it's, it's hard enough to get a gravitational wave to do anything, much less create this sort of gravitational wave. We have no idea. We, basically, the expectation is nothing like that happens. So. Is there any other? Yeah. Yep, it's a, it's a direct analogy. So there would be this, what's called a stochastic background. There'd be a bunch of gravitational waves of all different frequencies running around everywhere. And we're being bathed in them right now. And it's hard to imagine that that hasn't happened at some level. But remember, strong is 10 to the minus 21. These would be weak. So, yeah. And there'll be, I'll, 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 at the end, we can spend more time on questions. Um, so I thought I'd spend a little time now talking about how we will actually find these gravitational waves. So hopefully at this point, I've convinced you gravitational waves exist, and we're never going to see them. And so I'll tell you some ways we might actually see them. So. Um, on the left, that's a picture of Joe Weber in a bar detector. And we've already talked a little bit about that. The basic idea is very simple. You have this big hunk of metal, or it can be a crystal, or who knows what. But it sits there. It's a big mass. As gravitational waves go through, the, the waves should excite this. They change the length just a tiny, tiny little bit. And if you, you put a bunch of sensors on it, you might be able to detect those very subtle excitations. Um, this has become very, very sophisticated. It hasn't seen anything yet. But it's sort of the first way to do this. It was the first way that was attempted. Something that's been very exciting just recently in the last few years is this idea of pulsar timing arrays. Um, and I'm just going to say, you know, talk about this very briefly. It's, we've already talked about pulsars as these great clocks. Now, if you have a pulsar and it's this perfect clock, and a gravitational wave goes through and changes the distance, then the time of the arrival of the pulses is going to shift a little bit. It's a very small effect, but it's over a large distance. You can hope to measure this. If you observe many pulsars, you can hope to pull out information about the gravitational waves that are kind of passing through. Um, so that's something that might be very interesting. It's you know, something that's a very active field of research right now. You know, we'll have to stay tuned on that. But in some sense, the kind of vanilla generic detection of gravitational waves now is 
are laser interferometers. And laser interferometers are actually a fairly simple idea in some sense, and as you take two perpendicular you know, cavities, if you like. So here are pictures. Of these are just tubes. They're just empty tubes. And by empty, I mean empty. There's a vacuum there. It's a very, very good vacuum. It's a very large vacuum. It might be the world's largest vacuum. And you just shoot lasers through them, and there are mirrors at the ends. And, and what happens is you shoot a laser down one end and a laser down the other end, and they bounce off mirrors and come back, and laser light interferes. It's a very narrow frequency, and if you take two beams of narrow frequency, they interfere. And all that means is they produce a very recognizable pattern called an interference pattern. And what's interesting about that is you have this pattern. If the length changes, then the pattern shifts. So if you can see this pattern and you can measure it very, very accurately, you'll be able to see if the length changes because it would just shift like this. And so what, what has been done in the last two decades is they've built these laser interferometers, and these are built, these are real pictures. There's a US effort called LIGO. It's, uh, there's one detector in Hanford, Washington, one detector in Livingston, Louisiana, and then there's also a Virgo detector, which is in Pisa, Italy. And these have been running and have been doing this interferometry to look for gravitational waves. And this is my other plot. Again, the details are not, it's not important. This is, you know, this is sort of the noise curve. This is how well your detector is doing. And the only thing I want you to take away from this is, here is this sort of 10 to the minus 21 level. And right now, they're down below that. So right, this is what the detectors were doing uh, about a year ago. And they're below 10 to the minus 21. Or another way to say that is that they're now detecting along the, the, the arm lengths of four kilometers, or 2.5 miles. Along that length, they are measuring changes that are roughly 1,000th the size of a proton. Okay. That should completely blow your mind. It still blows my mind. I can't believe that this is real. I mean, I've looked at it. I still can't believe that they can do this. It's, it's 2.5 miles in two directions, and you're noticing changes fraction of a proton. Okay. It's unbelievable. It's, it's just, it's amazing. But they're doing it. Um, and, and that's incredible. Now, right now, th so this is where the detectors were. Right now, they're actually upgrading the detectors. They're making them better. They're putting in a better laser. They're doing better isolation. There's a lot of work to get this plot. Um, the plot's going to go down by one bar, which is an, it's a log plot. So it's going to it's gonna be 10 times better. And that's where things get really exciting. So just, just to be clear, gravitational waves have not been detected yet. This has been running. It has not actually seen anything. It's still an unbelievable plot, but has not seen anything yet. But we expect in the next few years that it will. So they're going to they're gonna be upgraded. Um, they're going to be operating at this new sensitivity in roughly five years. And at that point, I think the community overall fully expects that the first gravitational wave detection is going to happen. So another way to say this is, you know, this prediction has been around for 100 years, but we will finally detect our first gravitational waves in the next few years. And that's going to be a sort of revolution. And that's the real message here, is that this is about to happen. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick aside. Um, this is actually a sad story, and I'm just going to mention it briefly because it's just good to know the way science works. The gravitational wave detectors I'm talking about, these, these, these other detectors are on the ground. That seems fairly apparent. They're all on the ground. The ground moves. There are earthquakes. And it turns out that it moves a lot, especially at lower frequencies. So these, these detectors can only see objects that are roughly the mass of the sun. If something is much more massive, like a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy, these detectors won't see it. Okay. So if you want to see those sorts of objects, you have to be off the ground. You have to be in space. So there's been a mission called LISA, which a lot of people here uh, at, the, at these workshops and over the last you know, decade or two have spent a lot of time working on, which is a space version of an interferometer. These are, those are three spacecraft. 
the red lines are lasers. You're just, it's the same basic idea. You're just shooting lasers between these spacecraft. You're measuring the distances between them, and you're looking for these oscillations, which would be gravitational waves. Um, that instrument would be amazing. That instrument would see all binary black hole mergers anywhere in the universe, the first approximation. It's an incredibly powerful instrument. People have been very, very excited about that. In fact, the astrophysicists, who generally have been fairly leery of the gravitational wave people, because you know, what are we doing? You know, the astrophysicists are building big telescopes and looking at the universe, and we're building some tunnel in the ground. It doesn't seem right. But they, even the astrophysicists, realized this is really interesting and made it one of the priorities of what's called the decadal survey. So there's been a lot of excitement about this. Um, this is just a picture of here are the three spacecraft orbiting. You can just see they, they're in a separate orbit behind the Earth anyway. There are a lot of details here. The bottom line is here's something that's been proposed that would see supermassive binary black holes anywhere in the universe. Um, however, this is not going to happen. You can, you, can, you can kiss this version of Lisa goodbye. Um, you've probably heard their funding issues. The government's broke. This is one of the things that's been axed. So just in the last few months, NASA announced, forget it, we're not going to do LISA, which has been a fairly big blow to this community. The Europeans, NISA was a joint American-European uh, mission. The Europeans are still gung-ho, so they're, they were hoping that they're going to do a smaller version that they can afford. We'll see. But LISA, uh, as it was you know, previously envisioned, is, is not going to happen, certainly not anytime soon. So... So all that means is that, in some sense, the ground-based detectors are even more important. And just to remind you, we're going to see these. This is going to happen in the next few years. We're going to see gravitational waves. Okay. So, so I'm now going to just um, spend a couple of slides discussing why you should, uh, why you should really care. I mean, you know, it's all fine. We're going to see them for the first time. But what are we really going to learn? You know, why, why, why should this, you know? keep you up at night because you're so excited because you can't wait to see gravitational waves. Um, so why should you be excited? And uh, there are a bunch of things that detecting gravitational waves will do. Um, it'll confirm Einstein or not. So here's a clear prediction of the theory. Either we see, see the waves and they agree with what Einstein says they should look like, or we don't. If we don't, that's even more exciting. That means the theory is broken. And then we, you know, the theorists at least get to have a really good time. Um, but we probably will confirm Einstein. He was a pretty smart guy. He has a good track record. So, you know, we'll see. But that'll be the first thing that gravitational wave detectors do. They'll tell us whether this theory works. And um, then other things they'll do, they'll confirm the existence of black holes, another robust prediction. Now, we have a lot of indirect evidence that black holes exist. You know, we believe there's a black hole at the center of the galaxy. There are beautiful movies of a... There's a lot of stuff out there about black holes. But, but all of that, again, is indirect. Gravitational waves, you actually get to, in some sense, probe the, uh, the surface of the black hole itself. With gravitational waves, if you observe a black hole, you have observed a black hole. There is no argument, no question. You're done. And so, so in that sense, it's a very interesting probe of, of general relativity. Um, no worries. So one of the other things it'll do is it'll tell us about merging black holes and neutron stars. We'll see these very, very far away. They're not that far away in cosmological terms, but in human terms, you know, millions of light years is pretty far away, and we're going to see them happening. And we'll get an idea of how black holes form and how this all kind of fits together. We'll figure out what, neutron, what the stuff of neutron stars is really like, which is related to a lot of very interesting questions in fundamental physics. Um, we'll learn about supernovae. Again, we get to look right into the center of things. So we see lots of supernovae in, in the optical, in their optical emission, but we have no idea what's going on in the heart deep inside a supernova. And, and gravitational waves will tell us exactly what's going on deep inside the heart of a supernova. So that would be pretty interesting. Um, and something uh, that I've been working on is it'll also tell us a lot about the universe itself. Um, uh, how to, you know, what the age of the universe is. It'll, I would argue, you know, gravitational waves will probably make the most precise measurement of the age of the universe. It'll tell us stuff about the dark energy, lots, lots of other things. A lot of stuff we'll learn about, about gravitational waves. But, um, but in some sense, the, uh, the most interesting stuff, I mean, all that stuff is well and good, 
But, but the real reason that everyone is so excited about gravitational waves has to do with the fact that this is a completely new way to probe the universe, radically new. So the only real point of comparison we have is Galileo and the telescope. In some sense, that was the first time we really looked out at the universe. You know, Galileo looks out and he says, look, oh, there's Jupiter and it has some moons going around. And by analogy, we can assume that maybe the Earth is going around the sun and we're not actually at the center of the universe. And okay, he got into some hot water for that. But, but it's radical. By, by, by having a new view, he completely changed our conception of you know, humanity and where we fit in the universe. Um, every time we've had a new view, I mean, so in some sense that you know, we build better telescopes, we now have radio telescopes, we have X-ray telescopes, microwave, gamma ray telescopes. Each time we've turned one of those on, we've gotten a new view of the universe, and each time it's been a sort of a radical discovery. And in essentially all cases, whenever we do that, the stuff that's most exciting, the stuff that's most interesting is the stuff we didn't expect. I mean, we go through and we come up with all these things that we think are going to generate gravitational waves, but the assumption is, I mean, it would be astounding if we've actually got all the sources. Chances are there's all sorts of stuff going on that, that we haven't even conceived of yet, but that we'll see once we, we observe the, or once we listen to the universe in gravitational waves. And that's really, I think, why people are most excited, because this is a truly novel way to probe the universe. So just as a final you know, thought, it's, you know, we've basically been deaf to, what, to the universe itself. We haven't been able to hear what the universe has been telling us. We haven't been able to hear the excitations of space-time. And that's going to change in the next decade. And for the very, very first time, we'll be able to listen to the universe itself. And, you know, who knows what it's going to, what it's going to teach us. And so that's where, where we're at. This is happening, you know, in the next few years. And it's, it's going to be radical. It's going to be a true revolution. And, we're, you know, we're incredibly excited about it. Everyone should be really excited about it. And I'll just end with that sound one more time, because this is what we're going to hear, we hope. OK. I'll stop there. So I think we have time for questions. Um, OK. So that sound is a gravitational wave, um, which you would detect as this oscillation. And I've just taken that, that oscillation, and I've just made a speaker oscillate the same way. But instead of one part in 10 to the 21, it's a much larger amplitude. And I've just made a speaker do the same thing. And so it's, it's sort of what it would sound like, but, but it's, not, it's not, the detectors aren't doing that. But it's a good way to, to sort of discriminate between different, your ear is very good at hearing things. So the, you can put a lot of, the, the, the signal can be very complicated, and you can hear some of that complication, and that's nice. Um, and I forgot to repeat the question, which was, um, since I'm playing a sound, how does that relate? And Yes, everyone should come up to the microphone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, that, that just in, in relation to that last question, um, does that mean space time is oscillating at 1600 times per second or something? Is that? Yeah, that's a way to think about it. It's, uh, you know, it's, again, it's this sort of relative distance. But yes, it's oscillating at frequencies of kilohertz, okay. which is what the human ear can hear. Right. So that's uh, exactly yeah. right. Um, the question I have was in relation to uh, the LIGOs. Um, if you, the, the sort of um, things you're expecting aren't from LIGO technology. They're just going to measure solar mass sort of disturbances. Not yes, that's right. So what, if they're going to not have the LISA um, detectors, what, um, what, what do you envisage would, would, would be used to have this exciting um, frontier being broken down and exploring? Right. So, so, okay, so the LIGO detectors will only be sensitive to the stellar mass objects, mm -hmm. that's it. But those are very, very exciting. We're going to learn a lot from those. I mean, we'll also know whether Einstein is right, whether, you know, there really are black holes, all these things we're still going to learn. What we won't learn about is 
you know, what supermassive black holes are doing at the edge of the universe. So we lose some science, but we still get a lot of science by observing some of it. So one way to think about it is there are optical telescopes, and they tell us a lot, but they don't detect gamma rays. If you want to know about gamma ray bursts, you've got to go to gamma ray telescopes. So this is the analog. There are gravitational wave telescopes. Th we have one set which is sensitive to some, you know, some phenomena, but we're not sensitive to others. If we want to know about supermassive black holes, we have to build something in space, which hopefully we'll do eventually. But you know, we, this is still really good. LIGO is fantastic. Uh, you're, um, uh, uh, prior to this slide, you said that uh, you expect uh, that these gravitational waves be able to measure the age of the universe. Yes. Now, that implies that the universe had a beginning. Yes. And uh, also, I think if you follow the theory, it's going to have an ending. And yeah. but, uh, So at one time, the, uh, there was just simply nothing in this part of, of space. But it's part of the universe, so I, what's okay. the con I see a conflict here. Uh, yeah, okay, so let me, uh, so there are a number of aspects to that question. So yes, there's a Big Bang theory, and that theory, which is extremely well established, says that there was a beginning. Now the beginning is a beginning of space-time. Okay. Okay. So, so what we're talking about is space-time itself. This is what relativity tells us. There's space in their time, but you can't think of them separately. So, so when you talk about a beginning in time, you're also talking about a beginning in space. There's no concept of being outside of that. It all just happens. Okay. Uh, so, so, so this idea of what happens outside of the Big Bang, what was happening right here? Right here, this space didn't exist until the Big Bang, and then it existed. Right. Well, I've talked to people who have what I call an uns unsophisticated view of the universe, and they use the word always, that, that the universe has always been here and always will be here, and how that ties into the space-time concept, again, in my mind, is the conflict. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think from the, just from the physics perspective, the universe has definitely not always been here. You can measure the age. And when I talk about doing this, we already know the age roughly. It's 13.8 billion years. And you know, we're, that's maybe at the 5% level. We're hoping to get down to the 1% level. We can discuss this. But these are, you know, we're talking very precise measurements. And it's, it's a very well-established theory that fits together yeah, very nicely. So we, we can talk more if you want. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was wondering, how do black holes go around? How do black holes go around? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very interesting question. So, so you saw how those black holes were spinning around, and you're wondering how that happens. So the trick is that, so you know that the Earth goes around the sun, and the reason the Earth goes around the sun is because the sun has gravity, and the, the sun pulls on the Earth, because it's very massive. And it's the same sort of thing. Black holes are very massive, and they have gravity, and that gravity, in some sense, pulls on the other black hole, and that's why they go around each other. Um, Another way to say it is that the black holes bend space, and, and that's why they're going around each other. But it's all about gravity. So if I were very, very massive, I would be pulling you towards me because of my gravity. But, but I'm pretty skinny, so it's OK. <laughs> Are um, these gravitational waves going to uh, interact with dark matter? And if so, is that going to be able to uh, allow us to figure out more about uh, dark matter out there? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And it's so, so, um, so dark matter, as far as we know so far, dark matter only interacts through gravity. And gravitational waves are gravity. So gravitational waves should definitely impact dark matter. Um, the problem, and this is always the problem with gravitational waves, is that strong waves are still 1 part in 10 to the minus 21. It's a tiny, tiny effect. So even when you think of the strongest gravitational waves, all it's doing is taking the dark matter and going, you know, a little, little jiggle. And it's very hard to imagine scenarios, and I've really tried, where you could actually see something happening from the dark matter. Um, 
you can imagine cases in the very early universe where the gravitational waves are very strong and the dark matter is very dense where maybe something could happen, but even then, at least I haven't been able to come up with anything. So unfortunately, just because the waves are so weak, you, there's nothing observable. They interact, but it's just a very weak interaction. Okay, so the question is, are gravitational waves and gravity the same thing? Um, so when I say gravity, the way I think about gravity is really this full theory. It's general relativity. It's the full theory of space-time. Um, gravitational waves are an aspect of that theory. Black holes are another aspect of that theory. Now, you could say gravity, in the way we probably normally think about it, is that actual force. Now, the force, that's a Newtonian concept. In general relativity, it's this curvature. And so when you say gravity, you really talk about the curvature of space. And gravitational waves are also an aspect of the curvature. It's a sort of self-propagating wave of curvature. And so in that sense, they're related. But in one case, gravitational waves actually propagate on their own at the speed of light. So it's like you shake a sheet of space-time, and it goes off and you get some excitation, and gravity in that way of thinking is just, you have some massive object and it just bends the sheet. So they're related, but they're not exactly the same thing. Any other questions? Yeah so, yeah, so the question is, um, another way to think about this and a way that particle physicists generally think about this is that everything is quantized, that's quantum mechanics, and the quantization is, is um, uh, for, for general relativity, is called a graviton. And so it's the idea that's the quantum particle that's associated with the gravitational field. And there are really fundamentally two ways to think about general relativity. This is just sort of some background culture. There's a way which is, I think of this as the Einstein way, which is the right way to think about it, which is its curvature of space-time. And it's beautiful, and it's geometry, and it's really nice. But there's another entirely equivalent way, which is to think about it, it as a field theory, which is the way you usually think about quantum mechanical theories. And in that case, the way you think about these waves are as gravitons. Uh, streams of gravitons and you know different so so in some sense you could say well so what we're trying to do here is measure gravitons but that's um the the in my opinion the you know the waves in space time is a much easier way to think about it and it makes it much clearer what you're actually measuring but strictly speaking they should be equivalent now one of the other questions is how you know this leads to this question of okay if it really is quantized are there ways to measure that quantum behavior and get some sense I mentioned right at the beginning. We have quantum mechanics, we have general relativity, they don't play well together. But if we could measure something like a graviton, something about the quantization of general relativity, it would tell us how these theories fit together. So we'd love to do that, but um, it's, again, everything is so weak that, that the idea of measuring a single graviton and learning anything about it is, uh, it's, Right now, it's outside the realm. Of, right now, we're focusing on, let's just measure some gravitational waves, and then down the road, you know, maybe we can think about that. But there are some interesting you know, thought experiments you can do with gravity and quantum mechanics that you know, we can talk about later. It's, it's a very interesting subject, but it's not a, an experimental subject as of yet, unless you talk to Roger Penrose. But that's a separate thing. Any other, any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming. I'll stick around if you want to ask her. Welcome to the Aspen Center for Physics Public Lecture Series. 
The Aspen Center for Physics was founded in 1961 by local physicist George Stranahan with Michael Cohen and Bob Craig. The center provides a serene environment in which almost 1,000 prestigious physicists from around the world, young postdocs just out of graduate school to Nobel laureates, come together during winter and summer sessions to share, discuss, and initiate new research. It took only two days at the center before I realized that this was what I had always dreamed doing science would be like. The beauty and peacefulness of the center is a really important asset to us. It is our opportunity to be cut off just enough from the daily grind to have lively discussions at the blackboards, share meals out on the lawn, gaze at the surrounding hills, and actually think about physics. Thinking initiated at the Aspen Center for Physics, from biophysics to neutrinos to the outer reaches of the universe has provided the underlying logic for the MRI, the CAT scan, and laptop computers, and will in the future provide the logic for innovations that will transform human endeavors.